The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Thank you all for coming um, on a historic day in Chicago. Um, I am, uh, my name is Tarani Bedi. I'm the Associate Director of the South Asia Language and Area Center, and we are uh, one of the co-sponsors of this event tonight. And it's really an honor, actually, for us to be involved in this, uh, this uh, World Beyond the head Headlines talk, uh, because we are honored here to have Dr. Arvind Panagaria here. Dr. Panagaria is the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy, International and Public Affairs, and Economics at Columbia University. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, he holds a PhD in economics from Princeton University. He is also a former chief economist at the Asian Development Bank and an advisor to several multilateral financial institutions, including the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization. He has written or edited 10 books and numerous scholarly articles. He also writes a monthly column in the Economic Times, which really is India's top financial daily and he contributes to many, many other media outlets, including the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, India Today, the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and CNN Asia. Dr. Panagaria is currently an editor of the Indian Policy, India Policy Forum, which is a journal modeled on the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity and jointly published by the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and the National Council on Applied Economic Research in New Delhi. His latest book, The Themes on Which He Will Be Talking About Today, India, the Emerging Giant, was published in March of 2008 by the Oxford University Press in New York and is really a remarkable analysis of the history of the economic development of independent India. It has been described as the definitive book, I quote, on the Indian economy by editor of Newsweek, Farid Zakaria, who's also been a guest here at the I House, and a tour de horizon and a tour de force by Jagdish Bhagwati, one of the foremost um, economists uh, of India. For good reason, therefore, the book makes remarkable contributions both to scholarship as well as to policy. I'm sure that it will also generate much discussion here tonight. Therefore, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest of the evening, Professor Arvind Panagaria. And I will just, just to give a brief uh, a, a brief um, sort of introduction to what, how the, uh, the program will, um, will happen today. Uh, Dr. Panagaria will speak for about 45 minutes, at which point we leave the floor open for questions and then leave some time at the end of the program for people to go back to uh, perhaps purchase books and have a book signing since you have the author right here. And um, so that's sort of how it will function. And again, Professor Panagaria, welcome. It's my honor. Thank you very much, Tarini, for this uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, thank you, Denise. Um, uh, thank you, Jamie, for having me here. Uh, it's really great to be at the University of Chicago. Uh, University, of Sh University of Chicago was one of the three schools that had accepted me when I was applying for PhD in economics uh, some 35 years ago. Um, only that I got fellowship only from Princeton, so uh, in those days you really couldn't uh, uh, come to the U.S. Uh, unless you actually had a fellowship, so I came to Princeton. But uh, it, it really is great for me to be here today. Uh, um, um, also, I think, you know, uh, Tarini said it's a historic day, um, uh, and it really is also uh, both Columbia and Chicago connection here, uh, since uh, President-elect Obama is also a graduate of Columbia University. So, again, very pleased to be here on, on this very important day. Um, uh, I, I, what I would do uh, is, is give you a little introduction to the book, but rather than kind of describe the book, I'd pick up certain themes and, and, and go with those. Um, 
Now, you know, uh, 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 Professor Rosen is here, of course, so he, he has worked, uh, um, I mean, he, he is a, a stalwart of uh, a scholar uh, who has worked on India. But, uh, um, you know, when I came actually to the U.S. in 1974 uh, to my Ph.D., actually interest in India was really very much uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, nearly kind of absent. I mean, it, it had uh, been very vibrant in 50s and maybe, you know, parts of 60s. But by the time I got here, it's not too much interest. And as a result, you know, I had actually hoped uh, that I would write Professor John Lewis actually was, was at Princeton at the time, and he probably was uh, behind uh, my fellowship. Uh, and I thought I'll write on India, but, you know, very quickly I found out that uh, any thesis I did at that time on India would be on a huge discount. So I kind of turned to trade theory and, and as a result became uh, an international trade economist. But now India is, is back on the map, back on everybody's radar. Uh, and so it, it really is nice to be able to kind of write, uh, get back to what I actually had planned to do uh, long ago. Um, now, you know, even 20 years ago, uh, the way uh, Indian economy looked, actually, you know, uh, it, it, everybody was very pessimistic. And, and we uh, used to joke that the economists, you know, who work on India are of two types, you know, the, the optimist and the pessimist. And the pessimist takes the view that, gee, you know, there's so much wrong with India, I can't think it, it getting any worse. And the optimist says that, no, no, but I can. Um, uh, that has now kind of changed. That has now changed um, uh, the, the debate in India, you know, and, and this is something I'll focus on in a minute, but uh, in the last five years, uh, five financial years of India, which, which goes from April 1st to March 31st, uh, the country has been growing at 9% per year. There is uh, a, some bit of slowdown because of the crisis, uh, which is feeding into the Indian economy as much as uh, into any of the other world economies as well. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the debate nevertheless now has shifted to the pessimist saying that, look, you know, perhaps uh, the growth rate uh, uh, would not sustain to 9% and maybe, you know, and in, in the current crisis, it might drop to as far down as 6% and maybe on a longer term basis, it'll sustain at only 7, 7.5%. Optimist saying that, well, you know, if you continue with the reforms, um, you can push it to 11 or 12%. Um, to put my cards on the table uh, right uh, up front, uh, I sort of consider myself among the optimists, uh, and and I take the view actually that that with uh, some key reforms, India could actually move on to a uh, an even higher growth path. Although I think that in the, in the very immediate future, meaning the current fiscal year, uh, the growth growth rate probably will drop down to about seven percent or so. But let me kind of, you know, we'll, we can come in the question-answer session if you want to talk about the implications, you know, how I see the current crisis impacting India. Uh, but, but let me take the more longer-term view. This book uh, uh, starts about 1950 and brings you to about 2005, 2006, so about 55 or 56 years of uh, economic developments. Uh, uh, the first part of it uh, uh, deals with growth. Then there is a second part which deals with poverty and inequality. And then I go to macro in third part, fourth part, fourth and fifth parts are micro, fourth mainly uh, uh, focusing on in various sectors in industry, trade, services, agriculture. Uh, and last part is really, you know, micro in the sense of government, so tax reform, civil service reforms, uh, infrastructure, uh, and then social services, education, and health. So it really tries to take, you know, full view uh, uh, of uh, uh, and, and, and in particular focuses. Uh, so the first part, having you know completed the growth story uh, uh, in in about six separate chapters, uh, then the rest of the book really comes to focus on the uh, on the last twenty years, principally uh, covering through what big changes have happened and and how things look in various areas. Now, uh, I, I'll, I'll first tell you a little bit about you know where the uh, where the Indian economy currently stands. So. The last five years, the economy has been growing at about five, about nine percent per year. Uh, if you take a little longer term uh, view from late 1980s, 1988, let's say to 2007-8, uh, that uh, during that period, growth has been about six and a half percent. 
So on a steady basis, uh, the economy has been growing uh, at a solid rate of growth. Uh, there is another way, actually, I'd like to kind of to be provocative to say by saying that, look, you know, this growth rate of 9% is actually uh, uh, in terms of the real rupees. So once you correct for inflation and all, that's the real rupee growth rate. But during these five years, actually, uh, rupee also appreciated about 6% a year. Uh, and if you take factor that in, in real dollars, growth rate has been almost 15%. Uh, and, and how fast, you know, to give you an idea of how fast that growth rate is, not suggesting that this will happen over the next 20 years, but if it were to happen over the next 20 years uh, at, at that kind of rate, uh, the GDP of India would rise from current level of $1.2 trillion to about $18 trillion. The current U.S. GDP is about $15 trillion. So that tells you, you know, I mean, the power of compounding and, you know, how high the rate of growth of 15% really is. Now, alongside that, uh, as, as uh, 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 at the aggregate level, there is that kind of very high rate of growth. You also see a structural transformation uh, taking place. Now, India's structural transformation is a bit different uh, than, than uh, most of the countries that have actually traveled that path of very rapid growth. Uh, now, again, India is still, you know, 6.5% over a 20-year period, but, you know, countries like Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, China, they've grown even, you know, 8 to 10% per year for, a lo for, for that kind of uh, time period. Um, the, the, the transformation, uh, uh, and I'll talk about that a bit uh, later on, um, uh, in, in India it's, it's been a little different, and, and that, that part I'll come to later, but let me first actually describe to you a few facts which give you a sense of, you know, what kind of transformation has actually happened. So uh, uh, trade economist as I am, the first thing, you know, one looks at what is happening to the openness of the country. And uh, that is very much like uh, in, in the spirit of what uh, one has observed in a large number of other developing countries, that as they grow rapidly, they become more and more open. Uh, and one conventional measure of openness that we use is trade to GDP ratio. Uh, that is the uh, exports and imports of goods and services as a proportion of total income. That uh, index uh, of openness, uh, so trade as a proportion of the GDP, uh, in 1991 was about 16 percent. Today it's about 47 to 48 percent. So it's a threefold, uh, uh, 300 percent expansion um, and uh, 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 that is while the GDP, which is in the denominator, remember, is trade divided by GDP, and denominator itself has been rising at 9% per year, trade has to be growing very, very rapidly to, for, for that ratio to rise 300%. So it's a much more open economy today, uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and therefore it has to compete both on the export front as well as on the import front uh, in the way that it did not do uh, for many, many decades. Uh, Foreign investment, uh, that used to be minimal, uh, early 1990s, you can take again 91, 92, uh, the foreign investment into India total was about $300 million. Today, it's in the neighborhood of about $30 billion. Um, this includes both uh, portfolio investment and direct foreign investment. And in the Indian case, unlike most other countries, portfolio investment has been much larger, or certainly somewhat larger than the direct foreign investment. But you know, there is $30 billion worth of investment coming in to the country from abroad. Um, Integration has happened not only, you know, so there is this kind of trade integration, foreign investment integration with foreigners coming in, but now in the last some years, actually, there is integration going on in the opposite direction as well, in the sense that Indian firms, Indian multinationals are now actually going in, buying uh, uh, companies abroad, acquisitions abroad. Uh, and, and these are, you know, the, the big ones that you may have heard about. Uh, Arcelor was uh, acquired by Mittal. Uh, this is the steel uh, sector. Chorus, another steel company acquired by Tata. Uh, Jaguar, uh, uh, the auto company acquired by Tata also. The latest one was in the movie industry, actually. So the, the Indian industrialists are coming in to also invest in Hollywood. And the reverse is also happening. So Hollywood uh, uh, is, is investing in Bollywood. Uh, but... Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the latest one was the, uh, an investment of about $1.2 billion by Reliance Corporation uh, in DreamWorks, uh, Steven Spielberg uh, Works company. So there's that integration happening. Now, 
remittances are rising rapidly as well. These are the you know uh, 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 money that a lot of you and I remit uh, home to our families. Uh, that used to be about again two or three billion dollars in the early 1990s. Today, that magnitude in the latest year for which we have the data, remarkably, it's 40 billion dollars. So very very large sums coming in. Now, that's the external front, and, uh, and maybe I should mention, at least for completeness, uh, the, the success of the software industry from India. That again, uh, you know, we, we think that software industry you know, has been uh, India's traditional kind of successful industry. Truth of the matter really is that as late as 1995, uh, software industry was very small. Exports were about less than a billion dollars. Today, uh, exports by the software industry are about 40 billion. So again, very large, you know, so big, big changes happening. Now that's on the, all on the external front. Domestically, I think uh, the, the biggest success of the Indian economy and the reforms in particular uh, has been in telecommunications industry. I think I mean, that to me is perhaps the biggest story of Indian economic reforms. Now the you know, uh, uh, most of you I see here in the audience are, are, are young, but I think some of you would, would are, are certainly out there who are familiar with the old India uh, in which I grew up. Um, and I, you know, remember how bad the telecommunications uh, service used to be. Uh, we, we used to joke that, you know, you have to first stand in the queue for the telephone for four or five years. Uh, and then you get the telephone finally, uh, and you pick up, you know, you want to make a call and Dial tone is missing half of the time. And uh, the other half of the time, you'll get the dial tone. You dial, but you get the wrong number. Um, so you know, this is really, I mean, it, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but, but it certainly is, is really uh, uh, descriptive of, uh, essentially descriptive of uh, how bad the service was. That is on the quality front, but also on the quantity front, uh, you know, partly reflected in these very long queues for getting telephones. Uh, but also, if you look at the number of telephones that were available, uh, you know, 1991. So this is like, you know, even if you start counting from 1950, the beginning of telecommunication in the industry, although it actually started before 1950. So, but even, you know, counting from there, 40 years, total number of telephone lines in 1990 in India were about 5 million telephones. Total stock created in 40 years was just 5 million. Today, India is adding 8 million telephones per month, not per year, 8 million telephones per month. That's more than any country, actually, more than even China. Uh, even, even when China was at its peak you know, on, on telecommunications expansion, it was not doing 8 million. Now, this is particularly significant because you know, it's not, it's, it, 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 it is not that it just happened because the economy was growing. Actually, causation, in my view, actually runs the other way. Uh, it, it happened because of the reforms. Some major reforms got done, actually, uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, which really opened up this sector. Uh, in a big way to the private uh, firms. Uh, you know, now entry had happened a little earlier, but you know, a lot of barriers remained actually. But the reforms in the late 1990s, early 2000s really opened the door much wider. Uh, and that really is what kicked off this big, huge expansion. Uh, even as late as 1998, it's only 10 years ago, the tally density, the number of telephones per thousand in India uh, was about uh, a little below three, 2.8. Today, it's about 30. So, you know, 30 out of 100 people now have a cell phone in their hands today. Uh, and that density, obviously, is much higher in, in, in the urban areas. And, you know, given how many in India are self-employed, uh, that one single instrument actually is a, a massive source of productivity gain, I think. I mean, nobody has measured it. So, you know, ultimately, uh, economists like to measure these things. Uh, but once they get down to, I suspect that this would turn out to be a major contributor. Uh, uh, just a couple more facts. Uh, automobile, again, you know, those of you who have been in India in the 80s know that, uh, you know, India was selling uh, the uh, antiquated and antique uh, ambassador and Fiat cars. You know, you could buy it new, of course, in 1980s, but the model was actually the 1950s model. Um, uh, 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 and, and really, you know, that industry did not make any progress whatsoever in, again, you know, like the telephone industry. Uh, uh, but uh, then the opening up happened. Uh, now today, all the major producers are in the market, uh, and uh, India is producing, you know, about uh, close to two million passenger vehicles per uh, year. 
uh, you know, that's compared. China is about seven million, so it's, it's India and China are still on a somewhat of a different scale. But uh, two million is still a pretty large number, actually. Uh, even uh, you know, at the beginning of the the current century or millennium, uh, this number was like about five hundred million or so. So it has grown very rapidly. Airline industry has done very well as well. Uh, air traffic, uh, uh, both cargo and passenger, is rising at easily twenty percent a year or so. And those of you who have visited, you know. Domestic travel in India now is uh, probably generally, I think, more is smoother, more efficient, I would say, than sometimes in the U.S. Uh, here, you know, at some of the airports, it takes quite a while to get through, uh, much uh, faster, uh, and and you know, good service, good service. So, quite a bit of transformation has happened. Now, you know, so the debate on growth is 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 is, is very clearly resolved in favor of the reforms that certainly reform you know there is a debate out there uh, danny rodrick who is at harvard kind of argues that oh you know re- growth started before reforms and so forth but you know the book I, I, in the in, in in the book i you know very carefully dissect the various periods uh, i mean i argue that really uh, uh, for sure i mean growth did not actually get going before some opening up some uh, you know uh, piecemeal reforms started which which happened in the very beginning of the 1980s which bit accelerated with rajiv gandhi in the mid 1980s and and then a bit slowed down and then 91 of course was the big bang uh, and, and systematically, then reforms be, ha- began to happen. So it's not as though reforms didn't happen, but also I think you know if the big systematic and systemic reforms of the 1990s had not happened, that growth would not have been sustained. I mean, even if one kind of accepts the view, which which I personally certainly reject, that growth had uh, uh, gr- growth growth was triggered by something other than the reforms, um, it could not have been sustained uh, unless these very systematic reforms had happened from the 1990s onwards. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, what, let me, uh, uh, so, so the, 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 in a sense of the growth debate, in, in, essentially is, is, is resolved in favor of the reforms having actually uh, been behind it. Uh, the, 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 that immediately kind of you know, uh, invites the question, uh, well, fine, so growth has happened, but what has it done for the poor? So there's a big debate, actually. Angus Deaton at Princeton calls it the great Indian poverty debate. So there's been a big debate on numbers, you know, how much poverty was reduced and uh, did the uh, poverty reduction slow down in the 90s versus 1980s and so forth. Um, But, you know, in the end, I think there's a lot of problems with the sample surveys, particularly the one that was done in the big one that was done in 1999, 2000s. But since then, the next big one has come out in 2004-05, and, and now there is general agreement that certainly a significant amount of poverty reduction has happened. Now, this is, again, you know, uh, uh, the numbers are, 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 are arguable because it does depend exactly how you calculate these numbers, uh, but uh, there is not a whole lot of disagreement now on the broad fact that a significant reduction on, in poverty has actually happened. I'll give you the figure to give you a sense, you know, I mean, now, how, what is the actual level of poverty depends on where you draw the poverty line. You know, what do you regard as being poor? So the poverty line in India is a very low poverty line. It's, you know, basically uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of income that, that would be barely enough for you to survive. Uh, uh, but taking, taking that poverty line as given the official figures, uh, um, according to the official figures, uh, the, the proportion of population that was living below the poverty line in mid 1980s was about 46% in the latest sample survey 2004-5 it comes out about 27% so you do have a very large reduction in poverty now if you draw poverty line differently obviously these absolute figures will change but very likely a significant reduction in the figure nevertheless will uh, still be there so so that has happened uh, that then has in turn kind of you know uh, a, a triggered another debate which is a debate on inequality so uh, then the, the, the reforms and the growth that has happened has increased in equality. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'll not say a whole lot about it here right now. There is a whole chapter on inequality that, that the book has. Um, I, I take a kind of, you know, um, uh, n- not a particularly alarmist kind of view on, on, on inequality. Number one, actually, if you look at the data, if you, uh, you know, if you take the conventional measures like the Gini coefficient, which economists typically use to measure inequality, that has not moved a whole lot in India, mid-1980s to, to 
2004, five again, if you take this, uh, you know, maybe there's a 3% increase uh, in, in, in the Gini coefficient. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not a significant rise. And, and this is consistent with a large number of other countries where Gini coefficient does move very slowly. What has happened, however, is that uh, the regional inequality has gone up very dramatically. Uh, uh, one indicator can be the, you know, the, the income, per capita income in the richest state uh, versus the per capita income in the poorest state. If you look at that gap, that has clearly grown, uh, grown very substantially. Um, also, urban-rural inequality has, has uh, risen uh, very substantially. Again, I argue that, you know, I would not lose too much sleep over the inequality as such. Where I would lose sleep is poverty. And I would rather actually focus uh, the efforts of the policies uh, on combating poverty. And, and in a way, if one really focused on poverty, uh, a large component of the inequality will actually be uh, uh, taken care of. Because where are the poor? They're poor are in, in, in the massive state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, a, a state of 165 million people uh, and, and very large poverty ratio, Bihar. Orisa. So if you really focused on actually the states which have massive large numbers of poor in concentrating your anti-poverty programs, at that, uh, targeting anti-poverty programs at that, those states, then in effect actually these are also states with relatively low per capita incomes. These are the states at the bottom of the uh, uh, state income distribution. Uh, by uh, state per capita income distribution. So if you really f try to fight poverty, you will also fight inequality automatically. Uh, there is a set of other arguments I make there actually based on India's own experience, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, about which I'll talk in a minute, uh, uh, that, that, you know, when you focus your policies too much to inequality, uh, often you end up targeting the creation of wealth. In the, in the end, uh, you, you know, when you target the poor, you are trying to bring up the standards of those who are at the bottom. But when you say that, oh, I want to cut inequality, certainly that's how India did actually uh, massive uh, uh, concern about this kind of so-called concentration of wealth, which led to the adoption of policies in the end that actually uh, choked off wealth creation entirely in the 60s and 70s. And, and I'll come to that. So that's one of the concerns I, uh, I actually have that, look, you know, if, if you focus too much on inequality, a, 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 a very likely victim of that will be those who are actually creating wealth for you and therefore helping combat poverty. Okay. Uh, now, in the rest of it, let me, I'll, I'll tell you why I think this growth process is likely to sustain. Uh, and then I want to turn back a bit what went wrong in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and then uh, I'll uh, conclude with maybe a bit on, on uh, what are the challenges that India still faces, the big challenge India faces today. And, and if there is time, then I'll talk briefly about what India's experience uh, 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 offers uh, to the other countries, uh, what, what lessons can we glean from it. So why I think this uh, growth uh, uh, rate, uh, growth process will sustain itself, um, uh, there are two, three or four factors. One of the things is that um, the initial conditions are now very different. Uh, the, the, uh, there's considerable liberalization has happened, um, uh, 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 both domestically and uh, externally. So in, in a sense, you know, the technological changes that happen now in the world economy anywhere out there, uh, India is much better positioned to actually take advantage of those. Uh, entrepreneurs are now have their space in which they can operate, uh, which they did not have actually for a very long period of time. Um, you know, and, and, and in a way, I, I mean, I rely, I, I, I count a lot on, the, on India's entrepreneurs, which I think are, are absolutely top class. I mean, if you think about it, the kind of policies in which they operated in the 60s and 70s and still managed to deliver 4%, 3 to 4% growth, uh, that itself, you know, testifies to their uh, 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 resilience and, and the ability to actually deliver. Uh, and now that, you know, uh, a lot of those restrictions are pretty much gone, uh, they have a much greater play. I mean, Nani Palkiwala was a lawyer uh, in India, a very famous one. Uh, he used to say, that, uh, this was around in the 1980s, that, you know, India's entrepreneurs are absolutely top class, and it's not really easy to, to, to stop them from succeeding. But by God, our bureaucrats have got their talent. 
uh, th that they can really keep them down. Uh, but you know that hand of the bureaucrat has now been lifted off. So, so I think uh, uh, the, the chances are that uh, uh, th that that talent is is going to have, have its full play. But in addition, uh, you know, so so this is from the efficiency point of view, productivity, right? I mean, you know, in the end, growth depends on how fast the productivity is growing, and so for productivity to grow, there is not good reasons why we should feel optimistic. Then it also depends on how rapidly you your factors of production, the inputs grow. You know, the more rapidly the inputs grow, the more rapidly the output grows. Uh, and on that front, the key uh, uh, factor of production, of course, is capital. Uh, and that, of course, means savings. Now, India's savings rate uh, uh, has actually uh, continued to rise very uh, substantially and steadily. Uh, way back in the 1950s, savings rate was about 7 or 8 percent uh, during that decade. Today, it's about 34, 35 percent. And so it has really steadily risen even seven or eight years ago at the beginning of this millennium. The savings rate was more like 23, 24 percent, 34, 35 today, 10 percentage points expansion. It's a very phenomenal increase actually, partly driven by the, uh, by the financial sector reforms that have happened, but also partially I think you know, growth itself, higher levels, higher per capita incomes have allowed uh, a lot of the people who previously could not save, allowed them to save. So savings rate again has uh, 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 done well, and there is still scope actually for it to rise. Uh, corporate savings, for instance, you know, in India are still low compared to, uh, way below actually what they are in China. Uh, about 7 8% in China, they are uh, upwards of 25%. Now, India's the, uh, corporate savings are not going to rise like China's, but, but certainly they can rise well beyond what they are today. The other factor of production is labor. And here, demographic uh, 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 patterns actually are very favorable to India. It is not only currently a relatively young country, but it is a country in the next which is going to get uh, go going to grow much younger in the forthcoming 15 to 20 years. And what that means, of course, is that uh, as as the population grows younger, uh, you have the higher ratio of working population to the total population. So you know the very fact that more people are actually working as a proportion of the total population means higher output. So that by itself actually uh, helps the growth. This is also, uh, uh, you know, people, those who are employed are also the ones who do the savings. So again, that also uh, gives you a nice kind of a virtuous circle on the savings side. So I think these are the major factors I think, you know, uh, would the, the, that would help sustain the current growth. Uh, but again, you know, it, how, whether it further accelerates also is going to depend on what other reforms actually are undertaken. And, and I'll point out towards the end at least that, that at least a few re important ones really still remain. Okay, now what went wrong in the, in the 60s and 70s? Now in my book, uh, actually the first, so I divide the about 55 year period into four different phases. And first one going from 1950 to 1965, second 1965 to 1981, third 81 to 1988, and then fourth phase is the current phase coming from in late 1980s all the way to current. Um, I think first phase was okay, actually. I mean, uh, that this distinction is sometimes not made, but uh, actually when I researched this first phase, it turns out that the policies were not hugely restrictive. It is true that a lot of the uh, uh, restrictive, the, 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 the machinery, uh, the apparatus for a lot of the restrictive policies got put into place during this period, the licensing uh, of, of private entrepreneurship, the entry of public sector in a major way. Um, also some uh, li import licensing. These existed in this period, but actually the enforcement of these instruments was very liberal. So typically in on import front, if you applied for a license, you generally got it. Uh, import license, investment licensing also relatively liberal. Uh, what, so, so really, uh, and foreign investment, of course, uh, Nehru actually fought off the left parties in, in a big way uh, to keep the door to the foreign investment actually quite open. In fact, opened it a bit wider through a set of reforms uh, in, in the late 50s, early 60s. So, you know, this is relatively, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that a lot of the machinery for, uh, for uh, the, the restrictions was put in place during Nehru's period, uh, the period itself actually was, particularly 1950s, were, was relatively liberal. Then got began to tighten up in the early 1960s. And then when Mrs. Gandhi came to the helm uh, in 1966, uh, it took her a couple of years to consolidate her position. Once she had done that, she really moved very far 
to the left. I mean, and, and this was uh, a, a very conscious, and, and for Mrs. Gandhi particularly, uh, whereas, you know, for Nehru, I think, you know, economics and politics were separate. It was economic vision that, him, that actually led him uh, to the kind of state-driven uh, 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 development model. Uh, for Mrs. Gandhi, in a way, politics was really supreme. So in a way, economics was driven by the political considerations. And, 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 and she used some of these things to basically uh, uh, fight off some of her rivals within the Congress party first, and then actually to uh, uh, gain popularity with, with, with the populace. Uh, and, and, uh, and, du and, and during this process, I think, you know, a large number of restrictions got put in place. And I'll very quickly tell you about two or three major ones which really stifled basically the entrepreneurship in India. So starting 1969, uh, one of the changes that Mrs. Gandhi made was uh, she created this list of small-scale industries. Now, what, what this list was that any product that got placed on this list, the small-scale industries list, could henceforth be produced only by enterprises uh, which had an investment in assets of about less than $100,000. The limit was in rupees, but, you know, translation is about approximately $100,000. Uh, so it's not large, you know, it's a small, very tiny enterprises, really. So large number of the labor-intensive products, things like apparel, toys, uh, uh, all kinds of household consumer goods, you know, soaps, cutlery, uh, umbrellas, you, know, the, you name it, any products that China massively exported to, to the United States in the 1980s and 1990s, or before that Korea did, or the, Taiwan did uh, to the U.S., or even before that Japan did, most of those items ended up on the small-scale industries reservation list. So what happened as a result, of course, is that one, these guys were not going to actually, you know, export, they're not going to compete in the world markets. Uh, uh, you know, when you're that tiny, basically, you're looking at the market, you know, at, at most within 100 miles of your radius where you are. Uh, so what were the, you know, for a country which is labor, labor abundant, you know, large population, large workforce, uh, unskilled, large unskilled labor force, what you did was, you know, you basically condemned those to producing for the domestic market alone. Uh, so not only that happened, the quality suffered as well. And I'll speak to that in a minute. Now, simultaneously, this was also where Mrs. Gandhi had this uh, vision of garibi hatao, removal of poverty. You know, we've got to get rid of poverty. And as, as a part of that was this whole slogan of concentration of wealth, that the wealthy are getting wealthier. And so what she did was, you know, there was, there was a legislation put in place uh, called Monopolies Restrictive Trade Practices Act, under which any firm that or business house that had in assets in 1969 $27 million or more would be characterized as a large firm or a big business house. Once you got the label of a big business house, uh, what it uh, meant was that you were restricted to invest in uh, 19 core sectors only. And these core sectors were highly capital-intensive sectors, things like steel, you know, machinery, very highly capital-intensive sectors. So what you do is you take your most successful entrepreneurs, right? I mean, obviously, you know, anybody who grew to that, that size was one of your most successful entrepreneurs. These are your largest firms. So you, know, you, you come in and tell them that, okay, henceforth, you can invest only in these 19 sectors, nowhere else. So, you know, you cut them off. And, and the, uh, then again, labor-intensive sectors, you leave out for the, uh, for the small-scale enterprises. Uh, and alongside, she then went on. This is uh, also the period the, the banks got nationalized, insurance got nationalized, uh, oil companies got nationalized, coal mines got nationalized. Uh, a lot of the restrictions in the land markets and labor markets were put in place also during this period. But most importantly, I think from the industrialization viewpoint, this had an incredible... Uh, incredibly negative impact on uh, both the quality of the products and the volume of the products, you know, the growth of these products. The, I mean, the quality uh, is an interesting story I like to tell. You know, Jagdish Bhagwati in 1961, he returned from Cambridge to, to work uh, in the Planning Commission and, and, and at Delhi School of Economics. And so, you know, and, and the, he was kind of from the generation, at least was connected to the generation which had fought in the national movement. And so there was a, this, you know, sense of nationalism, patriotism in, in, in that generation. So when he came back from Cambridge and saw, you know, people very, you know, keen on all these foreign goods, uh, there was a, almost a craze for foreign goods, it's a little bit bothered. 
So, uh, so his mentor, his professor was Harry, Professor Harry Johnson, who was of Chicago actually, and also of Cambridge in England, um, uh, 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 and, and very famous one. Probably, if he had lived long, he would have won Nobel Prize, I think. Um, so he wrote to Harry Johnson, dear Harry, you know, really, I find uh, uh, it, 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 the craze for foreign goods in India rather disturbing. You know, anything that's foreign is so much craved for. So Harry Johnson was very witty, actually. Uh, and so he wrote back, you know, dear Jagdish, you know, if the quality of the paper on which your letter was written is any indication of the quality of the goods that India produces, the, the craze for foreign goods seems quite rational to me. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, those of us who grew during this period know actually, you know, that, that the, how poor the quality of the, uh, of the products was. I mean, you, you used, I mean, I grew up using these fountain pens, which were like fountains, you know, basically uh, the ink will flow out of it. Uh, 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 and, and you had, had the soaps. Again, soap was also placed on small-scale industries reservations. A lot of the, you know, except those who were grandfathered, like, you know, Lux or something, which was a bigger company. But if you bought any other soap, you know, it'll, peel your skin before it cleanses your skin. Uh, so it, it's really, so because you're not competing. I mean, the basic economics, I think, in some ways, is very simple. That in the end, if you're competing in the world markets, you're competing against the best. You've got to perform. I mean, even those academics, you know, who operate in the, in, in the global market, you, we really have to struggle very hard here uh, in, in the U.S. You know, you're barely keeping your head uh, out of the water. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, you can take the sports analogy. And, and since we're talking about India, I, I, I'll use the, cric the analogy of cricket. That, you know, if you want to produce world-class cricket players, you've got to play test cricket, me, which is the international cricket. You can't say that, oh, first let me just play my, you know, uh, 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 cricket in my, just in my area or at most within my state only or within my college only. And once I really learn well, then I'll go and play the test cricket. If you do that, you're, you know, by luck you might produce one or two world-class cricket players. But if you really want to produce a large number of cricket players, there is no shortcut to playing in the test cricket. Uh, and, and it is the same with entrepreneurship, I think. You know, if, you, if you really do go out, you learn from them, you teach them. It also forces you to actually work much harder because you know, you're fighting against, for your existence against the best in the world. So, so it really makes that kind of difference. And, and I think you know, that was the big, big loss that, that happened. Uh, so in any case, you know, by late 1970s, it began to be seen that you know, this process was not working very well. I think even in the end, you know, early 90, in 1980, Mrs. Gandhi returned actually. Hit, you know, the, there was this period in the second half of the 1970s of emergency, and then she called elections and lost that. And, and, but then she came back in 1980. And even at then, actually, Mrs. Gandhi was a changed person. You know, she, she felt that the system was not working very well. But still... Nobody during this period, the entire 1980s, wanted to admit that the whole structure needed replacing. The whole structure had been mistaken. Uh, so what they did during the 1980s mainly was to, you know, within the existing framework, you tried to uh, deregulate as much as you could. And, and so initial deregulation in the 1980s was slower. Uh, but but there is definitely you know you, I document that in, in in two of the chapters in the book that you know this this uh, piecemeal deregulation did happen uh, and growth did pick up a little bit you know from because what had happened was you know during the second period of Mrs Gandhi sixty five to uh, to nineteen eighty growth plummeted to about three point two percent it really fell. Uh, in the large part of the 80s, we picked back up of about 4.8%. So, you know, whatever had been achieved in the 1950s, which was 4% or so, uh, was recovered back. Uh, now, 1980, late 1984, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated, uh, and Rajiv Gandhi, her son, actually uh, succeeded her. Rajiv Gandhi was a much younger person, uh, so he was young, and he had also lived abroad uh, a, a substantial part of his life uh, in England. And I think it's seen things work a little better than, you know, even though it was not the U.S., but even in England, things worked a lot better, actually, at that time than they did in India. So in a sense, I think he saw that, that India was missing out. So his very first speech that he gave was that, look, you know, we got to prepare India uh, for the 21st century. I mean, so he had some different kind of vision, and, and, and so he wanted to deregulate, and he did start off, actually, two years, he did uh, deregulate quite a bit in 85, 86, 86, 87, and there was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, expectations, actually, even on the U.S. side, 
to the point that I remember the Wall Street Journal once wrote uh, uh, an editorial uh, calling him Rajiv Reagan. You know, so th those are the days of Ronald Reagan, and uh, Reagan was the messenger of the free markets. Uh, and uh, and and um, uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi seemed to be kind of uh, uh, going on that path, but in the end, his last three years, he got you know uh, captured by all sorts of uh, um, by, by all sorts of uh, um, uh, 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 scandals. There was one Bofors scandal, famous one involving the purchase of the uh, Swedish guns called Bofors, uh, and and he also sent an, sent his army. Uh, to, to fight, fight the Tamil guerrillas in, in, in uh, Sri Lanka where the army got beat up badly and all. So he got really sidetracked in the end and the whole process really never, you know, in a systematic way uh, took off. 1989, he uh, uh, lost the election. A uh, uh, couple of coalition governments came in which wanted to make change, but couldn't really actually. And, and by 1991, there was a macroeconomic crisis. Uh, this was this was largely driven by a huge amount of amount of external debt that India had created. Uh, there were large fiscal deficits in the budgets, uh, uh, and, and and by financed by borrowing abroad, uh, which in the end uh, resulted in very large interest payments on those loans, which India couldn't actually fully make good on. And in the end, June 1991, there was a macroeconomic crisis, balance of payments crisis. That coincided with Rajiv Gandhi being assassinated also. Narsimhan Rao came as the prime minister. And lo and behold, even though he was much older, actually, uh, he was a different kind of prime minister. He decided that you know, the whole system needed changing. So he brought in at that time Manmohan Singh as his uh, prime minister, as his finance minister, and you know, systematically began to reform. And so that's the period. You know, that, that, and, and that process is still has been a bit of a stop go. There have been periods when a lot of reforms happened. First three years of Narsimhan Rao, about five years or six years of Vajpayee government, large, massive reforms actually. Uh, then again, the present government, again, there is very substantial slowdown. So, uh, but nevertheless, you know, I, I, I personally think that you know, the reforms that happened in the uh, Vajpayee era uh, from about 1998 to 2004, 2003, uh, I think played an, 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 a, a, a pivotal role in India actually picking up to, nine, you know, accelerating from what was 6% growth to about 9% now. Uh, let me just uh, take three more minutes and, and uh, uh, conclude by saying, you know, what I think is the big challenge India still faces. I think India's big challenge, you know, growth, I think, you know, if it sustains 8 or 9%, that's not bad. So growth challenge in some sense, sense is, 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 is lesser of a challenge. The bigger challenge India faces is that even today, uh, about 55 to 60 percent of India's workforce is in agriculture. Agriculture taken by itself only, if you take out fisheries and uh, uh, forestry, uh, contributes only 15 or 16 percent of the total income. So here you got about you know three fifths of the population on about one sixth of the income living. So the living standards for a large number of the population are very low. How do you get out of that trap? Uh, the general you know, model that you see in terms of the experiences of, you know, way back in of the United States uh, or all the other developed countries, but also of the developing countries like Korea, China, Brazil, etc., is that when, when growth happens rapidly, industry grows most rapidly. So, you know, if the economy is growing at 8%, industry grows 12, 13, 14%. And so it really pulls in a lot of the workforce from farms into gainful employment. And typically, industry pay, pays better wages. In India, this process has not worked. Apparently, the industry has never grown very rapidly. Industry grows about at the same rate uh, as the GDP. So if you look at the share of manufacturing in India since 1991 till today, it has been about 17%. It just has not moved. Just has not moved. You, you can take industry more widely, 26 27%. That is the big kind of failure of the growth process itself. It also means that poverty reduction could, would have been much larger uh, than it has been uh, had industry actually led the growth process. Uh, in India, it is the services that are growing much more rapidly. Now, even in services, if these were like, you know, these high-tech services principally, then that would be okay. But, you know, high-tech services, financial services, uh, telecommunications, they employ very few workers, probably no more than 3 or 4% of the workforce. So the bulk of the 
workforce that's, you know, even if it leaves agriculture, it goes to services, which are informal sector services, uh, which are probably not very well paid. They're probably better paid than in agriculture. And, you know, certainly the, given the fact that poverty has come down uh, significantly, uh, surely the wages that these people are earning, even in informal sector services, are probably a little better. But that's not going to really get you there. I mean, because the process still remains slow, uh, even till today, the absolute number of workers on farms has been rising. So, you know, even though proportionately they have declined because of the population growth, uh, uh, the, the, the absolute number of workers uh, on the farms is still larger today than it was a year ago and larger than it was two years ago. So the land holdings have fragmented as well. Uh, the average farm size is about a hectare now in India, uh, uh, seven, uh, you know, so, so it, it really uh, uh, is, is, is an issue. You cannot be growing at 9% with this massive population uh, living uh, a, on extremely, extremely low living standards. What India needs to do, there is a lot of reforms have happened which can help the industry, small-scale industries, reservation in particular is now gone, investment licensing is gone. What still is very troubling is the labor markets in India. There is a law which says that if you have 100 workers or more, you cannot fire the workers, uh, even if you go bankrupt. So with that kind of labor market, law, labor laws, uh, no firm is going to go and invest massively in uh, uh, what are labor-intensive industries. So you see, you know, very large <coughs> apparel firms in, in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. You see very large apparel firms in Sri Lanka. You don't see them in India. I mean, China, of course, is on a totally different scale where, you know, apparel factories often employ thousands of workers under a single roof. In India, you get very small shops uh, where, you know, a few tailors are working. So I think this labor law needs to be tackled, uh, which the present government has refused to. Uh, we'll have to wait and see whether the next one does. Uh, and then the power sector, that's the other big one. There is the other infrastructure, transportation and all. I'm quite optimistic. That's a problem. I think India understands the solution. It can be done, and that will happen. I mean, I'm optimistic in, seven, in five to seven years, transportation infrastructure bottlenecks will be largely kind of relaxed. Uh, it is the power sector and labor market reforms, I think, are the two key reforms I would push for if uh, I could, uh, uh, if I had my say on, on, on that. Uh, I think that will get the industry manufacturing going, labor-intensive manufacturing. I think that's what needs to get going, and that will then start pulling the workers out of agriculture uh, 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 much faster, and thereby also increase productivity in agriculture. You know, part of the problem in agriculture is that your worker-to-land ratio is not only high, but it's still continuing to rise. You, so, so if workers could come out of there, you would also raise the productivity in agriculture itself per, per worker. So uh, that, I think, is, is what India needs to do. And with that, I shall conclude. Thank you very much. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.